vessel unworthy, so so scarred by sin, but he did not despair. He started over again, and I bless the day he didn't throw the clay away. Over and over, he molds me me into his likeness he fashions the clay a vessel of honor I am today all because Jesus didn't throw the clay away But when I stumble and fall and my vessel breaks, he just picks up the pieces. He doesn't throw the clay away. fashions the clay a vessel of honor I am today all because Jesus didn't throw the clay away In uh, Genesis chapter 21, um, there's going to be a couple of messages that will uh, come out of this uh, chapter. Uh, we're going to get into the first part of it down to about verse 8 tonight. And then by God's grace next Wednesday, uh, we'll pick back up in verse 9 and move along. Uh, but uh, this is one of those great chapters in the Word of God that um, has uh, really so much in it that uh, we could go through series after series after series on it. Um, and, uh, but I'm going to hit the highlights of it, if you would. And uh, tonight, the title of the message that I want to preach on is God Keeps His Promises. How many of you believe tonight that God keeps His promises? Amen. Amen. Um, and we're going to see that God keeps one of the great promises that He made uh, in the Word of God. And uh, the promise that was made ultimately, even though it was, it was repeated multiple times uh, throughout Genesis up to this point, ultimately it was made 25 years before it actually came to pass here in, verse tw or in chapter 21. Um, and if God made a promise to you 25 years ago, some of you probably would have already forgotten it by now. Amen. Uh, others would have given up and thought there's no way God will ever do what he said he was going to do. Uh, but I want you to know tonight that we have a God that always keeps his promises. There's never a promise he's broken uh, to you and I. And so if you would, we're going to stand to our feet as we reverence the reading of God's word tonight. Genesis chapter 21, and uh, we'll be in verses 1 through 8. And do keep your Bible open. I'm going to have you go through some uh, other scriptures and things tonight as well. The Bible says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Now, you remember, if, uh, if your mind will go back with me just a little bit, do you remember that Abraham laughed at God when God said, you're going to have a child? Sarah laughed at God when God said, you're going to have a child. And so God gives them a child whose name means laughter. I think God does have a sense of humor, right? 
God always gets the last laugh, doesn't he? Amen. And uh, it says in verse 4, And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to what? <laughs> Amen. So that all that here will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should give children so? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. I'm going to preach tonight for a few moments on God keeps his promises. Be seated and let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity tonight to be able to open this book and be in this great chapter. Father, to find out, Lord, what thus saith the word, considering the promises, Lord, that you made, not just to the nation of Israel, not just to Abraham, Lord, but to us tonight. And Father, we thank you that you are a God that keeps your promises. We thank you, Lord God, that when you give us a promise that we can count on it. And Father, tonight, bear witness with our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Speak to us, Lord God, tonight. Encourage us tonight. And we'll give you the praise and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when you look at uh, Genesis chapter 21, you're going to find that it is one of the great important chapters in the Word of God. And for three reasons. Number one, because it deals with the past history of Israel. Uh, it is in this chapter that the beginning of the nation of Israel really starts, if you will, because it's out of Isaac that Jacob comes, who becomes Israel, and then out of, Israel, or out of Jacob that the 12 tribes come that uh, become the 12 tribes of Israel, if you will. And so you go and you can trace the history of the nation of Israel all the way back to the moment we're at here in Genesis chapter 21. Number two, it is one of the great chapters that deals with prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look here, you find a type and a picture of prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in Isaac. Now, Isaac uh, was, was a, a child that was born of a supernatural birth, as we can see here. We know Jesus Christ was born of a supernatural birth. Number two, when you get over into Genesis chapter 22, you find out that Isaac was the sacrificial son, uh, that he was taken up on the Mount Moriah. Many believe where the Temple Mount itself is at. And uh, there he was offered uh, as a sacrifice under the guidance of God who sent at the last moment a ram caught in the thicket. Uh, there's so much typology there. But we know that Jesus Christ, not only did he have a supernatural birth, but he had a, a, a sacrificial life and death. Uh, he was offered up, a picture and type, if you will, of God the Father offering up his own son uh, for the sins of the world. I mean, there's a lot of information there, and it goes on and on and on. Isaac's bride was called out of a country and retrieved and brought to him by a servant. We know that there's coming a day whenever the bride of Christ, which is the church, is going to be called out of this world uh, to be united with him up in heaven and, uh, and, and we'll always be there with the Lord. Amen. And so there's, there's a lot of prophetic typology here. <clears throat> Number three, we find also a lot of practical instruction and inspiration for the child of God. And so we're going to look at some of that tonight from a practical standpoint, uh, dealing with the promises of God for you and I. Now, I want to give you one more thing here real quick before we get all the way into the message. It's not just an important chapter, but it's an incredible chapter. And let me explain to you why I say that. Whenever you look through Genesis chapter 21, you're going to find the fulfillment of one of two great promises that God made to Abraham. Now, back in Genesis chapter 12, God made Abraham two promises. One dealt with soil. Uh, God told Abraham, uh, as he called him up and he said, Look out before thee, I'm going to give you this piece of land. He gave a, a property, a piece of soil, if you would, uh, a land grant uh, to the nation of Israel. And it's never been taken away except by God's design. I mean, it is, it, it is their land. Amen. Uh, it is not the Palestinians' land. It is the land of the nation of Israel. And so he gave him soil. He promised him soil. But number two, he promised him a seed. Way back in Genesis 12, he promised a seed to Abraham. Now, Abraham had to wait a long time for that to come to pass. And we'll see here in a little bit, he jumped the gun on that thing. Uh, at one point. 
But ultimately, he promised him a seed way back in Genesis chapter 12. Now, that seed would ultimately become Isaac, out of which would come two of the greatest gifts that this world has ever known. Number one is the Savior. It was out of this line, down through Jacob or Israel, down through the lion of the tribe, or down through the tribe of Judah, that Jesus Christ himself came into this world as king of the Jews. And so we see that the Savior came out of that seed, but number two, the Scriptures came out of that seed. Because out of Isaac comes the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel was who God entrusted, or the Jews, was who God entrusted with the Word of God. No Gentile was ever commissioned to write the Scriptures. It was given to the hands of the Gentile, I mean, uh, to the hands of the Jews. So we have the gift of the Savior, and we have the gift of the Scriptures because of that great promise of the seed that was given to Abraham. Now, do you believe tonight that God keeps His promises? It took 25 years for that promised seed to come to pass. Now, I want to I show you three things about that tonight that I believe will be an encouragement because some of y'all have been given a promise by God. Some of y'all are holding on to a promise and it's yet to come to pass. And Satan is going to try to get you to give up on God. And let me tell you something, when you give up on God, that promise is going to stop. It, it puts it on hold, if you will. And I'll explain why I say that here in just a moment. But if you will trust God, if you will have faith in God, then you will be able to watch that promise come to pass one day. Now, I want to show you three things tonight. Number one, in this passage, we're going to see the endurance of God, God's promises. The endurance of God's promises. Uh, look down in verses 1 and 2, and I want you to notice something. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had what? Said. Now, underline that. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had what? Spoken. Underline that. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had what? Spoken to him. And so here we find that God originally gave this promise to Abraham and to Sarah many years earlier. He told them that I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you the promise that you will have a natural seed, a natural pros uh, uh, posterity, if you will, that is going to come through your own loins. I'll show you that here in a minute. That will come through your own loins, and that will come to pass one day. But that was years and years before. Now, notice, though, that God's promises do not have an expiration date on it. Your milk may have an expiration date on it. Your peanut butter may have an expiration date on it. Uh, your meat may have an expiration date on it. Here lately, Melissa has been buying meat from the clearance section of Walmart. I said, man, you're on the bottom of the barrel when you buy meat from the clearance section of a store. Amen. Uh, but she's buying it. I'm still living. I'm here, and I'm not, di I'm not dying right now. And so uh, it must be all right. But that meat has an expiration date on it. So they reduce the price, and they'll sell it right before it gets ready to kill you. Amen. And so anyway, I said all that to say this. There's a lot of things that have an expiration date on it, but God's promises do not have an expiration date on it. Some of the promises that God made are 2,000 years now in the making. We've waited 2,000 years for the rapture of the church. And a lot of people are mocking and saying, oh, that's a false doctrine. No, God promised it. It's coming. And if you'll just hang on to your britches long enough, you're going to lose them one day when you go up. Amen. God's promises do not have an expiration date. Uh, a great writer by the name of Barnhouse said this, God is a God of His Word. If He did not keep His Word the whole universe would fall apart. Now, that's a literal thing. Let me explain why I say that. God uh, basically spoke something, said something, and set it in motion. And if he didn't keep his word, every molecule, every atom, your own body itself would fly apart right now. Let me show you something. Go over to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1 and 2. <clears throat> 
Hebrews 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. All right, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. The Bible says, Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made what? The worlds, now watch this, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things. Now that's a direct reference back to the worlds that the, the world uh, and, and and that was created, the heavens, the earth, everything, <clears throat> if you will, planets, you name it. It says upholding all things by the what word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. So he gave he, he spoke it, and his word is what's holding everything in place. If you don't believe it, there, let me show it to you again. Second Peter three seven. Just go to the right. You'll run right into it. 2 Peter 3, 7. I'm giving you evidence right now that God is a God of His Word. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. <clears throat> the Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and 7, But the heavens... That's talking about the first heaven where the clouds are at, the second heaven where the uh, stars and planets and all that. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same what? Word are kept in store. In other words, they're kept together by God's Word. So the proof that God keeps His Word is the fact that we have not flown apart yet. The fact that we are bound. Do you realize that the, the molecule structures that bind our atoms and cells and all that together are shaped like a cross. Did you know that? Look it up. That's God's Word that made all that. God made us like that, and when He made us, He made us with our cells bound together by something that looks exactly like a cross. Not a plus, a cross. And so I said all that to say this, God's Word is sure. When He gives us a promise, we can count on it. The Bible says all the promises of God are, are, are yea and amen. Now, I want to say this. Did God keep his promise to Abraham and Sarah? Now, did he keep his promise to Abraham and Sarah even though they had faults? Yes? They had plenty of them, didn't they? By the way, faults are things that are internal. Faults are things that are internal, okay? Internal problems. Did they question? Did they doubt at times? Um, Abraham, no, Sarah, yes. You'll find out she was the one that did the doubting, and Abraham just got on her bandwagon there. I'll show you that here in a little bit. But I said all that to say this. God's promise was not eliminated by their faults. You and I have faults tonight. We all do. There ain't a person in this room that does not have faults in their life. But that's not going to keep God's promises from coming to pass. Number two, did they have failures? Failures are external. Those are the things that you can see. Whenever a bridge fails, you know it failed because it, it collapsed. Amen? So you could see it with your own eyeballs. You've got, how many of y'all have failed God? Did they fail God? We just talked about last time how Abraham lied. He went from friend to fallen. But did that keep God from uh, uh, making his promise come to pass? Absolutely not. My point is this. Whether or not you have faults, whether or not you have failures, God is still going to keep his promise. So don't let Satan wear you out over that. Uh, go with me to Joshua 23, 14. Joshua 23, 14. I want to show you what Joshua said. And then we're going to move right along. Joshua 23, 14. Probably would do you good to underline this in your Bible. Joshua 23, 14. Page 
page 284 if you've got a Schofield Bible. Joshua 23, 14. The Bible says, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. So Joshua knew he was about to die. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing, now watch it, not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. Not one thing failed. All, A-L-L, all, are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. So can we say tonight together that God is a God that keeps His promises. So we see the endurance of, of God's promises. Number two tonight, I want you to see the extent of God's power. The extent of God's power. Uh, go back to Genesis chapter 21 and look with me in verse 2 now. The Bible says in Genesis 21 and 2, For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son, underline this, in his old age. Look in verse 5. And Abraham was a hundred years old. Down in verse 7. And she said, Who would have said to unto Abraham that Sarah should give children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now how old was Abraham when Isaac was born? A hundred years old. Now I said that to say this. When you look at this and you see what happened and what God did, you see, number one, a miracle. A miracle by the power of God. It was literally impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have children. Impossible. But I've got a God that likes to specialize in the impossible. And let me explain something to you tonight. Whenever God puts you in an impossible situation... It is not so that you are to be made miserable. It is not so that you can be defeated. It is so God can show you His power. Because it is only in the impossible situations where you will see the power of God come to pass. If it's not impossible, you can take credit for it. Amen? But when you get in an impossible situation and something good comes out of that and God moves... Who gets the credit for that? Only God does. When you've got an impossible bill to pay, and suddenly, supernaturally, the money comes in, who gets the glory for that? God gets the glory for that. When you've got an impossible diagnosis at the doctor, and there is no hope, and then suddenly somebody uh, is healed from that, who is the one that gets the glory for that? Why, it's none other than God Himself. Listen, God will allow you to get in impossible situations so you can see His miracle working power. I thank God for the impossible situations I've been in. At the time, I didn't like it. But when I saw God move, you're talking about a faith-building experience, and I've had several impossible situations come into my life, and God moved in a miraculous way that only He could get the credit for. So we see the miracle working power of God that He will allow impossible situations so that you can see His power. But number two, I want you to see the means. Now, I know what you're saying tonight. You're saying, preacher, I believe you. I believe God's a miracle working God. But I can see on the faces of some of you here tonight that you're saying this, I believe you. I know we serve that same God today that, that Abraham served back then. I know he's still got the same power, but God's not working in my impossible situation. Why? Why did he work in yours, or his, or hers, but I'm not seeing him working in mine right now? There's a reason and a means and a way to get God's power to work. I want to show you how Abraham got God's power to work. It is not found here in the Old Testament. Go over to Romans chapter 4, and I'm going to show you what happened, how he got the power of God to work for him. Romans chapter 4. If you would find verse uh, 17, Romans 4, 17.
Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Now this particular chapter is built and based upon the life of Abraham. And I want you to look here in verse 17. The Bible says in, in Romans 4, 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's a reference directly to Abraham, who was already previously mentioned in the chapter. It says, Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Boy, I like that, don't you? God calls those things as though they were not. Now, now look at it again. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. When God says it, whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. Amen? Now watch here, though. I'm going to get you, on the way, I'm going to, get you to the point where you can flip God's power switch on in your life. You ready? In verse 18, who against what? Believed in hope. In other words, when all hope was lost for Abraham, God said back in Genesis 12, uh, I'm going to give you a seed, and I'm going to give you soil. 25 years go by, no seed. Okay? And it seemed like all hope was lost. But watch it, again in verse 18. Who against hope believed in what? Hope. In other words, he never lost hope. That he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. Remember what? We just covered that. So shall thy seed be. Verse 19. And being, and this goes to Abraham, and being not weak in what? Faith. In other words, he kept his faith. He never lost hope. He considered not his own body now dead. In other words, he was physically incapable of fathering a child. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was physically incapable of being able to conceive a child. In verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through what? He never lost his faith. He never lost hope. God gave him that promise, and he never staggered. It says, but was strong in what? Faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able, or able also to perform. So if you want to cut God's power switch on in your life, you've got to have faith that God is going to do what he said he would do. That is the power switch. As a matter of fact, Warren Wiersbe said this, faith in God's promises releases God's power in our life. Faith in God's promises releases God's power in our life. You need to believe God can. Now, I don't know how to put it any simpler than that. Just believe God can. Instead of believing God won't, start believing God can. Just sit back. Let me just say this. I had a situation come up about a week ago. And um, it dealt with uh, a particular individual. And uh, I, 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 I didn't even speak a word of it to my own wife, not to my children. I didn't want to burden them with it. And so here's what I did. I got down on my knees and I said, God, number one, I need you to show me a scripture about what to do. Number two, I want to trust you in this. I got up, God gave me a scripture about what to do. It wasn't what I thought it would be. As a matter of fact, it was the opposite of what I thought he was going to have me to do. So I trusted the scripture he gave me. He gave me a promise through the scripture, and, and I trusted him in it. And I kicked back and relaxed, and, and, and honestly, it was, it, was, it was as though, if you, could, if you could make a mental lawn chair, I was laying in it, son. I'm telling you, I was kicked back. I was sipping on the iced tea of the Holy Spirit of God based on that, that one promise that he gave me. And on Sunday, I got a text from that particular individual, and what I asked God to do, he literally did it word for word. And I, I had a big bite of food in my mouth. I got choked when I read it. Melissa and the boys thought I, was, I lost my mind. And I said, hold on a minute. I coughed and I hacked and I carried on. I read it again and I said, let me show you. Let me show you. And now I'm going to tell you the story. And at lunch on Sunday, I told them the story and I said, I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to burden you. Y'all got enough on you right now. I said, but this is what was going on. This is what God showed me. And this is what I prayed. And I said, and I just kicked back and enjoyed the ride. 
and it happened literally like it, it, I prayed and like the scripture said. Now, I said that to say this. It would have been easy for me to take things into my own hands. It would have been easy for me to go and address or do whatever needed to be done. And I promise you, had I done that, I would have messed the whole thing up. God keeps His promises. Now, I said all that to say this. If you will just trust the Lord, you will flip on the power switch in your life. If you will just trust the Lord, you will flip that power switch on. There, there was a, um, and, and I won't keep it much longer, but I've got one more point real quickly, and then I'll be done. But there was a man that fought um, in the Union Army, uh, and when the war was over, this man really had nowhere to go. He didn't have a home to go back to. He didn't have any family. Um, and he had fought, and he had fought valiantly for the Union Army and everything. And he could not read or write, but somebody handed him a piece of paper and said, this has Abraham Lincoln's signature on it. It is his handwritten signature. Well, he just thought the sun rose and set on Abraham Lincoln. And he took it, he folded it up, he put it inside of his pocket, and he kept it there. He couldn't read it for nothing. He, he did recognize the signature, but he didn't know what was on the paper. And so sometimes he'd get to talk to somebody, and he'd say, hey, I got Abraham Lincoln's signature. And they'd, no, you ain't got Abraham Lincoln's signature. Yeah, I do. And, and he'd keep it in his pocket. He pulled the paper out. He never would unfold it. He pulled the paper out. He said, right here's Abraham Lincoln's signature. He said, I've got it right here. He said, you can make fun of me all you want to. Yeah, I might not have a home. Yeah, I may be poor. But how many of y'all have got the signature of Abraham Lincoln? Finally, one day, one day he got into a, a, an argument with a guy about, uh, you know, he just was ragged and homeless. And the guy said, won't you get a job? And he's talking all that. And he said, I've got Abraham Lincoln's signature. He pulled it out. And that guy said, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. He said, I've got it right here. He said, what do you have? He said, I've got the president's signature. That guy snatched it out of his hand before he had a chance to put it back, unfolded it. Sure enough, there was Abraham Lincoln's signature on that paper. Do you know what the paper was, though? It was a pension that Abraham Lincoln had given him for his uh, service in the Union Army, and it was worth thousands of dollars. And that man had in his pocket, while he was living on the street and was, was ragged and hungry and starving and didn't have a roof over his head, he had in his pocket thousands of dollars worth of pension and he never even knew it. And that guy said, well, you big dummy. He said, you don't even need to get a job. He said, you've got everything you need right here. And the man went and cashed it in, was able to buy him a home, was able to have food and live the rest of his life out like that. That is exactly the way a lot of Christians are. They have God's power at their disposal, but they never activate it through their trust and their faith and their belief. You're the one walking around saying, I've got God's Word, but yet you're poor and ragged whenever it comes to the power of God. Believe this book, and I promise you, you'll see God do supernatural things. Let me give you one final thing and we'll be done. I got five minutes and I can do it. Now, right, you ready? The endurance of God's promise, the extent of God's power, but thirdly, we see in this passage the excellence of God's plan. Now, I want to show you, and we're going to go back over to Genesis 17, 21 and follow a thought through these chapters here. Genesis 17, 21, if you would. Notice in Genesis uh, 17, 21... The Bible says, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this, now underline this, this what? Set time in the next year. Okay, go to Genesis 18, 14 now. Just flip the page over. You'll run right into it. Genesis 18, 14. The great statement that uh, is in Genesis that we talked about, is anything too hard for the Lord? Well, the answer to that is no. And the Bible says, at the, what? Time appointed. The time appointed will I return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, Genesis 21, where we were at, and look at verse 2. <clears throat> Genesis 21, 2. 
I'm going to show you how not to make a mess out of things here. Now watch this. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at what? The set time. Now let me just ask you a quick question. Who set the time? God. Did God make the promise? Yes. But did he set the time? Yes. Not Abraham, not Sarah, but God. God said there's going to be a time when this comes to pass. Now, here is what God will do in your life. He will give you a promise, but he does not give you the exact time for it. Is the time set? Yes. But he does not give you a, a time frame. He does not let you in on that. Because if he did, then what would be the point in faith? He wants you to trust him. He wants you to have faith in him. And so he will say, I'm going to give you a promise, but you're going to have to wait on me. And if you will wait faithfully on me, which is what Abraham did, except for one little point, um, if you'll wait faithfully on me, then I promise you I will take care of my promise for you. But you're not the one that sets the time. So here's what we do. So we see the time is set by God, but here comes the trouble. We don't see God move when we think he ought to move. We don't see God do what we think he ought to do when we, we think he ought to do it. So what do we do? We take things into our own hands. And what, how does that ever work for you? Not good. <laughs> Amen. Let me show you how that worked for Abraham and Sarah. If you would, uh, look with me in uh, Genesis uh, 15, I mean 16, Genesis 16, 1. They got tired of waiting. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, he told him all over again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, an heir, a seed, and uh, if you'll just be patient and wait on me. And here in Genesis 16, verse 1, Genesis 16, 1, watch this. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. Okay? So they obviously, you know, he made the promise. God made the promise, but it hadn't come to pass yet. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. You see that? She's saying, God is not going to keep his promise. God's not going to keep his promise. God's kept me from bearing a child. You told me God said that we were going to have children, and we're not. We've not. So God's kept me. He's not keeping his promise. So let me take things into my hands. She said, I pray thee, go in unto my handmaid, or into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. By the way, from that point, it was 13 years later before God ever spoke to Abraham again. When he listened to his wife instead of the voice of God there. Now, I mean, I'm not telling you not to listen to your wives. I'm not saying they don't have good advice and things. Don't get me wrong. But when God tells you one thing and your wife tells you another, you better go with God. Okay? He listened to her, 13 years went by, and God didn't speak a word to him. Now listen to this. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah, and Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. So after 10 years, things didn't work out like she thought they was going to, so she took things in her own hands. He went into uh, uh, Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Can anybody tell me who the child was that was birthed through the union of Abraham and Hagar? Ishmael. Now, from that day forward, if you look at the scriptures, it says Ishmael will be a wild man and his hand will be against every man and every man's hand will be against him. Do you know that out of that union that was outside of the will of God and outside of the timing of God, that whenever Sarah took things into her own hands and Abraham listened, that Ishmael was born and that from that day forward there has been a war between Ishmael and Isaac, between the Arabs and the Jews, between the Muslims and the Jews. And that thing has not ceased in thousands upon thousands of years. Because of why? Somebody was not willing to wait on God's timing. Jim McGay, he said this, um, he said, um, God always works at the right time. God always works at the best time. And God always works at the appointed time. Let me say it again. God always works at the right time. God will always works at the best time. 
And God always works at the appointed time. So the best advice I can give to you tonight is wait on God to fulfill His promise. Has God given you a promise? Why don't we come and trust Him in it tonight? Let's stand to our feet as we give the invitation. Lord, bless this invitation tonight. Father, thank you for letting us be able to learn that you are a God that keeps your promises. And Lord, tonight, help us to flip on the power switch in our lives by simply having faith in you, trusting in your timing and in your word. And Lord, help us to see you do miracles because you are a miracle-working God. And we ask it in Jesus' name. While these are praying, if you need to come, you come on the altars open.